Well, if you will, if you'll consider the, this scenario, uh, this situation with me uh, for a moment. Uh, a husband, a father, and a CEO. Uh, he has uh, what, what many would describe, and probably himself, uh, he, has, he has made it. Uh, and the world that he has built around him is his ideal world. Uh, he, he seemingly has, has everything. Um, as we've seen a lot in our world, uh, though, uh, this CEO's power and his authority has, has gone to his head. Uh, and over time, he has forgotten really where he uh, where he got started, uh, such a lowly positions before, and he has uh, grown his his world, his empire, his kingdom, and everything seemingly revolves around him now. Uh, the leader has been uh, thinking about. Uh, he's been thinking that he can do whatever he wants. He can get what he wants, uh, however he wants to do it. Uh, regardless of how immoral it may be. Uh, if he wants it, he, he goes after it. Uh, he has women that are all around him. He treats them uh, as, as personal pleasure. Uh, he, he really doesn't care much for his kids. Uh, he, he's far too busy building his own kingdom. Uh, one late afternoon after his staff are gone, uh, he... He makes eyes with a young married woman who also is alone, and he pursues her. He's enchanting. He, he's predatory, in fact. His one-night stand with her ends up with a child that's on its way. He covers up this, this scandal as best he can. Uh, he tries to keep that scandal quiet and even goes so far as to, to try to cover up his, his indiscretions by trying to set up the woman's husband. Eventually, he ends up plotting a way for her husband to be killed, and so he sets up a hitman after him question. With a scenario like that in a situation, would God forgive a man like that? Should he? And maybe, maybe another question that would follow would be this. How bad can you be before God would actually not forgive anymore? How bad can you go how deep can you go in sin before you are even out of reach of God's forgiveness? Um, how, would a, how, how, would somebody even, how would somebody even begin to make it right with God if they, if they wanted to? The, the depths that they've gone to, the, the indiscretions, the scandals, the uh, how would they even begin? to make it right with God. It's a hard to imagine, isn't it? It's hard to imagine because I think for the most part, we read those on the headlines and we would consider that person for the most part out of reach. Uh, certainly, he deserves justice. To be clear, he is an adulterer, he is a murderer, He's an abuser. He's full of himself, just for starters. In a culture like ours, we would say he's canceled. What would a man do to even begin to make it right with such deep, egregious sins like that? Well, we find out 
exactly how that happens out of Psalm chapter 51. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 51 this morning. It is the account of of a man who is is broken. Perhaps you have picked up the story and this situation that I lay out. It's the story of, of one great king, King David. The, the very one who wrote nearly half of Psalms. The, the same one who is called in Scripture a man after God's own heart. With that kind of situation? How? How does... How does how does man make it right before God with that kind of, a, of, of slander and, and situation in their, in their world? As deep as that is, with, with offenses that are so egregious, how can you possibly be made right with God being that dirty. Psalm 51 is an account here of a man who seeks the face of God in the midst of deep sin against God, treasonous sin against God. So as we come to this psalm this morning, David has, <clears throat> David has been exposed. Uh, all has come out. There is nothing hidden. God knows it all, and now so does everybody else. Nothing's hidden. And and after the loving but sharp rebuke of the prophet Nathan, that's found in 2 Samuel chapter 12, you can read of the account that I described for you in 2 Samuel chapter 11, the prophet Nathan is sent to to David and in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, and David is, as we come to chapter 51 of Psalms, he is a broken man. He is broken, not, not just busted. There is a world of difference between busted and broken. He is broken. He has sinned against the Lord God Almighty. He has built his own kingdom. He has abused. He has brought immeasurable unimaginable pain and hurt to countless people. Sin always is deeper and broader than we will ever imagine. And this is how a broken man, chapter 51, comes before God and experiences restoration. That's chapter 51. A, uh, a companion uh, chapter, if you wanted to look later, would be chapter 32 of, of, of Psalms. But here we are in Psalm 51. And let me say this as well. Here we are, we'll be talking about um, repentance. How to be made right before God. Uh, repentance. My guess is that... Uh, that that for many of you, most of you, you, you came in and you have a, a world that is on your shoulders. You have a ton of things going on in your world. And, and you are, are, are coming in this morning. Here's my assumption. You're coming in and you're hoping to be able to experience some peace. You, you, need, you need peace in your life. You need some relief. You, you need... Uh, joy, and so, wow, the topic is repentance. Not what I needed. I, was, I needed something completely different. This is not what I was aiming for this morning, and so you were just maybe a little hopeful the door was a little bit closer and nobody would know. Um, 
let me, let me offer for you this morning, if that's you, that, that very well, perhaps, this is the path that God has for you to be able to experience the very thing that you desire, which is peace, relief, and joy. And that God has for you this very path through chapter 51. That's my prayer. That is my hope. So why don't we even invite the Lord and talk to him about this very thing. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you with this this heavy topic, but yet one that can be incredibly freeing for us, I ask that you would set free those who feel captive, that that you will give us ears to hear this morning. You will guard us from distractions. You will guard us from, uh, you'll open our ears to hear. Help us. We need you. Teach us through your word. And I thank you that you don't just leave us, but you give us all these things for our good and your glory, Lord. Thank you. To you, we look to your word through you, through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 51, let me just read the first couple of verses for us and see where where David is coming from as he is to make right relationship with God, if he is going to be restored before God, and and what does that look like? Here's where it begins, verse 1. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Do do you see? He is clearly bringing out his need for, for cleansing. He, he, he needs God to make him clean. In other words, you, you, you can hear him say here in this, this broken prayer, my sins are staring me down. And I need, I need help. I need relief. And so he's crying out to God. Notice how dirty David feels. I mean, in verse, in verse 2, right? Completely wash away my guilt. So wash away. Cleanse me from my sin. I, I am dirty. I, I need you. If, you. if you jump down to ver- verse 7, purify me and I will be clean. Wash me. I'll be made whiter in snow. I, I need you to cleanse me. I need purifying. I am I'm dirty. And, and there, there is no, there, there's no way to be washed of that apart from God. And so where is he going? Where do we see him going in the midst of recognizing the depths of his sin? He's going vertical. He goes to God, right? He's bringing this before God. The, 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 he recognizes here there is, there's no hiding from God. Nothing is hidden from God. Nothing is hidden from God. And, and so David outs himself. Verse 1, my rebellion. Verse 2, my guilt. My sin. You see it over and over again. My, my rebellion, my sin, my guilt. Sin is rebellion. 
again, here's a topic that um, we feel uncomfortable with when we talk about sin. We'd rather not talk about sin. We would uh, rather talk about just more happy things and, and not have to look at, at sin, in particular, not have to look at our sin. Because when we look at our sin, there's a whole lot of shame and, and guilt. And when we look at our sin, we see, as David, I pray, we see rebellion against God. We see guilt against God. And so there's, there's sin. And sin is, uh, is, is all about building our lives, our kingdom, uh, apart from God. We do it on our terms, our way, apart from Him. Where it gets a little bit fuzzy sometimes for us in our, in our lives is we will sometimes give lip service to the fact of, uh, I'm inviting God into my life, but what we often mean in our heart of hearts is, God, I invite you in to do my very will. And so if you're going to help me to do what I want, then I'd love for you to be a part of that. I need you. And so it gets a little bit confusing sometimes uh, when we start talking about sin, that this is, uh, th- this is him building his own world. His actions say. He may give different words. So sometimes in words, we'll give certain words, but actions will, will follow the true heart. And the actions are, I want you to do what I want. Uh, and, but that's, that's not what is happening here in chapter 51. The other thing with, with sin is, is, is coming to the realization that sin really is, uh, and I mentioned this and maybe you caught it, it is treason against God. Sin is treason against God. Well, that seems awfully harsh and I'm really not all that bad. Uh, <laughs> generally, I think for the most part, especially in church world, we feel like we're, we're fairly good people. We're on the nice list. I'm on the nice list. Not all that bad. I mean, I don't, I don't murder like this guy did. Uh, you know, and just not all that, not all that bad. Uh, and we will have a tendency to minimize our sin, uh, minimize ours, not others necessarily. Uh, we will read it all across the news and go, oh, absolutely that. Justice. I want justice for them. They're rotten. Can't cancel, right? And not me, though. I'm not that bad. And so we minimize our own sin. And, and when, we, when we make ourselves big and God small, things get really, really tossed. Um, we, read that, we, we sang that a little bit earlier. God is bigger than I thought. God is bigger the more we realize who God is, the smaller we become and the more we realize how, how far our heart is. And, and maybe I should so throw in as well. We also recognize this as believers and it is a constant place of realizing God is big and, and I am small and I am in desperate need of a Savior. I continually need Jesus. And there's this place of continual coming to the Lord. Not just a one-time deal. I don't just come to God for fire insurance. Uh, I come to God because I need Him uh, to be in relationship with Him, and and my sin has a, has this this pull that, that that wants me to set up my own kingdom and find relief my own way. And so we have a tendency to to minimize that. My, my guess is, for, for many years, if I were to say, do you believe in the cross of Christ? You say, well, absolutely I believe in the cross of Christ. Are you dealing with sin in your life? Um, ultimately, for the most part, I think we don't think we're all that bad and we tend to minimize sin. Uh, and so, a reminder... I was thinking of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. It says, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? What we see here in chapter 51 
is a man who comes to the end of himself. He, he comes to the end of his excuses. There's no attempts to cover up, to hide. He's broken. He's broken. How, how, do, I, how do we know that he's broken? What evidence is there that he is broken? There's no blame shifting. There's no blame shifting. He's taking full responsibility. He's not... uh, Well, if she wasn't there, she didn't make those eyes at me. It, it just happened. I, I just got the invitation. I, if, if you go back to Genesis, the, 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 the blame shifting begins right out in the beginning of Genesis. God's like, hey, what's going on? Not, Adam, what's going on? It's not me, it's her. She gave me the fruit. She's like, oh, okay, hold on. Not me. It's a serpent. That's not me. It's immediate blaming. We, we see this with kids all the time. Not me. He's the one that did it. Immediate, we, we cover up. We hide. David's not there. He's broken. Immediate of just taking responsibility. There's no blame shifting. <clears throat> Clear sign of, of repentance. And there's a full recognition of of his offense against God. Verse 4, against you, you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. You are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. The, the, The repenting heart, the broken heart before God, they they agree with Scripture's indictment. Come on, God, I'm not that bad. God is right when he passes judgment. That's what we see here in verse 4. God is right. In other words, David is praying, my eyes are wide open. I, I, I see it all, Lord. I see what you see. I see it. And I am guilty as charged. No blame shifting. Taking responsibility. Brokenness. Look how this unfolds for us. Jump into verse 6. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. You teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be made whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. And catch this line. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. You see, when, when, we, when we hide in our sin, and in fact, when we come under the discipline of God, it, it is crushing. And he recognizes, Lord, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. I, I, I want to rejoice in you again. I, verse 9, turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. I love this. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Where have we heard those verses before? Anybody know? We just sang them, right? You're like, wait, I just sang that. Yes, yes. Um, right there. Here's the pleas of a man who is broken before God. 
That, that, that verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, I'll be made whiter than snow. It is God alone who cleanses. You want to be clean? It is God alone who can do it. It is God alone who can cleanse. You, you can try lots of different techniques. You can do lots of different things to find relief, but you will never find relief. You will never find cleansing apart from the work of Jesus Christ. It, it comes through God. And, and let me make this clear. That is his very nature. It is the very nature of God to, to clean, to cleanse, to forgive. It's his very nature. It's his very being that does that. And again, look, look at David. Where, where is his eyes? Where is he looking? Vertical. He, he's turning to the Lord. He recognizes where he's at and his sin and the egregious sin of where he's been and, and he's now turning to the Lord. Here's what I know. I know that we fall into these places of sin and we feel like there is no way that God is going to be able to forgive me again. Maybe last time, okay. But again? What if, what if I've been here already for the hundredth, five hundredth, thousandth time, and here I am calling out to God again? There's got to be a place where God just says, okay, enough, I'm done. You know why we think that? Because we would do that. If you, if you were to just continue to come up and just slap me in the face, like, oh, first time, I'm like, oh, I'll turn the other cheek, right? I got two cheeks, and you're like, oh, okay. Third time, uh, there's a point where I probably, in my humanness, will stop forgiving. I'll be like, man, there's a problem here. Uh, there's got to be a point when God says, no, enough. I, I, I'm not forgiving anymore. Over and over again, I, no. We think that because we would do that very same thing, but that is not the nature of God. Why I love the backstory of this to Psalm 51? Because it's terrible. It's bad. And here's a man who's finding forgiveness and the grace of God. It's for you and me as well. It's the very nature of God. And so instead of turning inward, we turn vertical. We go, we go up with it. We turn to the Lord. Your sin. The thing that keeps tripping you up. You keep falling into. You keep finding yourself there. You turn to the Lord. You, 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 you don't hide. You, you don't cover up. You don't uh, shift to, oh, it's this, it's something else. No, you, you're, you're out with it. No, it's real. And, and I'm bringing it before you, God. It's all laid out. Not like it's some surprise to you. You know it all. But Lord, I, don't want, I want you to know everything is open before you. Here's my heart. I lay it all out before you. And that's what David does. I, I, I love this. It is filled with this incredible hope for me. For me, a sinner who's in desperate need of, of daily grace of drinking deeply of the grace of God. It's just right here in these pages. God, create a clean heart from me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 12, restore the joy of your salvation to me. Sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Oh, God, would you clean me? Would you restore me? Give me peace. I'm lacking peace inside I'm broken. I need you. I restore the joy of your salvation. Have you experienced, have you experienced when, when, you, when you first came to realize the light came on in your soul that you are a sinner, that you have offended God and you've built your own kingdom, you have gone your own way, and, and the, the the, the lights were turned on in your heart, in other words, and you're like, man, I have deep sin. And, 
in that point of salvation when you have turned that over to the Lord and, and, and you have, with, with a broken and contrite heart, you have turned to the Lord and you've trusted in Christ of what Jesus did on the cross by dying on the cross for our sins, for your sins, those sins that the light has come on in your heart. You're like, oh, I don't like looking at this. I, 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 I'm uncomfortable. It just feels terrible. And, and the, the Lord has turned the light on and you turn to him and that joy that you experience, that moment of forgiveness that you experience in the Lord, you can fall back into sin and, and you're going to feel distant from the Lord. You're going to feel like, oh, something's off. What has happened? You're going to feel this distance from him. And, and so what David is praying, oh, restore the joy of your salvation to me. Restore that. I, I want to feel that again, that, that forgiveness, that cleansing. I want to be clean before the Lord. I, I turn to you. Help me. And, and again, don't forget this is the very nature of God. He is the one who creates. He's the one who renews. This is his nature. This is who he is. I find it also interesting as he, David is, is praying to the Lord for himself, for, uh, for healing, for, for restoration. He is praying for himself. I, I find it interesting uh, periodically, I will come across believers who will say, well, I don't pray for myself. Uh, I pray for others, but I don't pray for myself. And I, I find that, uh, actually, when I sit down, I want to I hear more. I want to better understand that. Because what troubles me with that is we have multiple examples of, of the psalmist praying for himself. He's praying to the Lord, and, and you see, this is what Christians do. Christians are repenters. They, they regularly repent. Uh, I've mentioned this before. I want to be the CRO, the chief repenting officer of Summit Ridge. Uh, I am wanting to constantly be one who repents before the Lord. Um, I, need, I need Jesus. And, and so that requires me to pray and ask God to, to move in my heart and my life. That's what Christians do. We, we regularly come before the Lord and, and pray. And so he cleanses, he, he renews, and, uh, and you can be made new, afresh. That maybe sounds a little bit crazy, uh, I appreciated Dane Ortland in his book, Deeper. Here's what he said. It's not easy to believe that we're clean. To take God at his word at this point is probably not far different from telling a man convinced that he has a high fever, you're healthy. But so it is. We must believe it. Define what we feel. Believe it audaciously. Believe in this cleansing with gospel defiance. It's good. God is a cleansing God. He is a forgiving God. He is the one who restores. Is that how you think of God? Do, do, you, do you picture God as a forgiving God? Or how do you picture him? What, what do you think of when you think of him? I was reminded of uh, Psalm 130. Verses 3 and 4, Lord, if you kept an account of, of iniquities, of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that you may be revered. God is a forgiving God. It's his very nature. So my encouragement to you, church, is to, to trust in him and believe. Trust and believe. And then here comes the final verses of, of chapter 51 of, 
what repentance looks like. When there's been repentance and what does that look like? And then let me just give a couple of words of what it doesn't look like in the midst of that. But here's verses 13 and following. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God. God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. In other words, he doesn't want lip service. I'll just go through the actions. Oh, if I go to church this week, should be good, right? Kind of balance out the bad, go to church. Eh, Probably, hopefully. I don't want just just lip service. In fact, throughout the Bible, we see numerous times when God says, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He doesn't want lip service. In in fact, the lip service God finds revolting. I'll, I'll, I'll say the right things. I'll look really good. He wants the heart. Verse 17, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. So there will be sacrifices, there will be things, there's action that goes, but it's following the heart. A heart that is broken before the Lord that seeks forgiveness. He doesn't want lip service. He, he, the true heart brings about the action. It brings about the change. Here's what I see out of 51. Repentance, what repentance looks like. And again, maybe just a couple of pointers of what repentance doesn't look like uh, when, when there isn't repentance. One, what we see out of 51 here is There is a godly repentance, and godly repentance always brings about brokenness and a calling out for God's grace. It it is is not just broken, but it's also calling out for God's grace. Um, Judas Iscariot was broken, but never called out to the Lord. He went and took his own life. There is a brokenness here, a recognition of sin, and then there's a calling out for God's grace. Uh, The Apostle Paul uh, says there's a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Uh, Godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. And and there's a world of difference, a, a massive difference between them. And we see this godly sorrow here in chapter 51. In my years of of ministry, uh, I have seen that repentance uh, is is seen over time, not just in a moment of tears. I've seen repentance take place over time, not just in a moment of tears. Uh, Repentance always addresses this as well. Here's a sure sign of repentance. We talked about this earlier, right? Full responsibility, taking, taking responsibility of his actions. It recognizes the hurt that the sin has caused. It addresses the hurt that's caused to others. It, it, it's not just an apology that makes up for it. It takes responsibility. I realize the hurt. Depending upon how egregious the sin, it may be even help me understand even more. I I want to understand the pain that I've caused. In, In godly sorrow, in repentance, there is a commitment to change through the power of the Spirit of God. Uh, 
a, a marker when there is not repentance, there is still a guardedness. A, a, a hiding. There will be um, some defensiveness from the offender. Those are oftentimes clear indicators of worldly sorrow, not godly sorrow. Uh, for instance, a, a spouse who has been engaged maybe in, in pornography, has been caught, and are they busted or are they broken? Uh, busted will bring about a worldly sorrow. A godly sorrow will bring about brokenness. Indicators. I'll do whatever I need to do because I want to be clean. As opposed to excuses. Yeah, it's just once. It was, oh, it, just, it was just one moment of just low. I just, I don't know what happened. It won't happen again. Uh, see this. It's common in, uh, in, in abusive relationships when a spouse has been abusive to another. There'll be tears and there'll be an apology, but not really any change. There'll be a guardedness, a defensiveness. How come they can't get off my back by now? And, and so there's sometimes tears and an apology, but, but not any change. And that's seen over a, the, the long haul. It's seen over time. When there's misuse of power, uh, there's a number of, of ministry leaders uh, that maybe you, are, uh, you, you listen to or whatever who have fallen out of misuse of power, and, but they, they're okay now. They're fine. No change. The other thing I'd say with, with a godly sorrow, with repentance, is that there is, uh, there, there's no protecting from the consequences. When there's real deep repentance and a turning, and I'd say we see this here with David. There's no pulling back of the consequences. I'm not trying to just guard uh, myself from the consequences. No, whatever, whatever may come, what's most important is that I'm right with God. So whatever we need to do, let's get right with God. Um, maybe last, uh, last two points that I'd say that I've seen in repentance of, of godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow of, of true repentance. There, there's an assumption by the offender that forgiveness should be offered by the offended. Uh, I've made my apology, so you should automatically just forgive me, and it should be done and over. Uh, trust should be automatically given. Uh, we, we don't believe in fast forgiveness. Oh, boy, I should have stuck to my notes. Uh, what does that mean? Um, there needs to be forgiveness, but forgiveness does not mean that I immediately, everything is okay, and there's no consequences, there's no effect to the sin that's taken place. Forgiveness is an issue be before the Lord, and, and it's also a process. There isn't just a fast forgiveness. Oh, you apologize? Okay, well, we're good. Uh, depending upon the sin, we're not okay. <laughs> Trust has been destroyed, and it takes time to build that. Uh, potentially years to build that. Uh, so, when, when the offender, uh, the, the one who has sinned and is, is broken, uh, will, will, will find themselves as one grateful for the person who called them out in sin. Wow. And when was the last time you saw that? Uh, and, and two, I would say in that is that they recognize that there is a process for the one who was offended against to have to, to, to process and to verify repentance. They, they recognize it's going to take time, and I'll be patient and wait with you in that. I, I'm open. Ask whatever you need to. Uh, I, I'll go there with you. Lastly is... 
repentance always has a distaste for sin, a hatred for the sin. We see that here in Psalm 51, that there is a hatred for the sin. It's, uh, there's a hatred for it. Distaste. That's a godly sorrow. That, that is a repentance. So if you view your, your sinfulness as maybe more bothersome, it's kind of just a headache, bothersome headache, more than a lethal cancer, you will see tepid growth, if any. This is a reminder that we need Christ. This brings us back to to that relationship with with the Lord. And then it happens horizontally. You, you can't get the horizontal right without getting the vertical right first. It goes vertical, and then it goes horizontal. We have here in this passage what forgiveness looks like. No, no matter the depths of your sin, God's grace is greater still. Here's here's the truth that as you think about your own sin and the comfort you need, potentially the comfort you can offer to others. In the book Gentle and Lowly, the thing that makes you Wince most only strengthens his delight in embracing you. At your point of deepest shame and regret, that's where Christ loves you the most. You see, this this openness before the Lord, you open your heart up, and, and, and God just loves ministering to that. He goes deep into that. He moves toward you. It goes on, and this this just just always wrecks me. One day we'll stand before him quietly, unhurriedly, overwhelmed with relief, and standing under the felt flood of divine affection in a way we never can hear in this life. Jesus says in John 6, 37, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. This is a promise. This is the very nature of God for us sinners. We need Christ. And Psalm 51 here is a man who is broken before the Lord. There's no pretense. There's no hiding. It's, it's why I love when, when, when we're real in church. This is, this is real. We can put up a lot of masks And, and what we get here is real. A man that needs God's forgiveness, and it comes through Christ. A man who is clean before the Lord. This is the place where we experience peace, relief, joy. This is the path. This is what we really want. Let me pray for us. Father, this this passage that comes to us this morning is a 
one that we need. We, we need to be reminded of your grace and your mercy. Reminded of your, of your kindness. Reminded, Lord, of the forgiveness. Cleansing is found through Christ alone. Lord, I pray that, that each of us has our, our hearts open to you. We are squarely looking at our sin, our, our very troubles, our, our very sins, and we are laying them down before you. No more hiding. That we will experience the release of guilt. The the transforming grace of, of your Son. That we'll experience the peace that surpasses understanding that comes because we are a people that are forgiven. Sinners saved by grace. That's us. And that's my prayer, at least, for anybody who does not know that Lord, I pray that they will call out to you. Not just experience brokenness. Brokenness on its own, Lord, as, as we know, is hopeless. But Lord, the hope that is offered through the cross, through your Son, we need you. May today be a place of hope. It is, it is our prayer that you will move. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.